Okay, hello and welcome to this lesson on how did opposition to Tsarism grow under Nicholas II. This lesson is going to be particularly useful to you if you're an AQA A-level history student studying the Tsarist and Communist Russia from 1855 to 1964 unit. However, it's equally going to be useful to you if you've got a general interest in Russian history, especially leading up to the outbreak of revolution in, in 1917, which caused the overthrow of Nicholas II. So to start this lesson, what you're going to want to do is get yourself a pen and paper, write out this title at the top here, and then our keywords and their definitions. If you want to pause the video here so you've got time to copy out the definitions, that's absolutely fine. And what I'll now do is start to go over some of these keywords and the definitions behind them. So first one, we've got the word liberalism. Now, what that means is basically a belief in making society more democratic. So I've put down a belief in capitalist democracy because in Russia, that was the form that liberalism took. They wanted to advance Russia on from being a kind of backward czarist autocracy more towards being a democratic capitalist country like the rest of Western Europe. Second belief is socialism. Now, this is a, a general word. There are quite a lot of different sub beliefs, if you like, that come under socialism. But most broadly, it would count as a belief in the advance of the working class and in greater equality between the rich and the poor. <clears throat> so that's one of the major beliefs we'll be looking at today. Then third, we've got the social revolutionaries. This was a socialist party who based themselves mainly around the peasantry rather than around the industrial working class, which the, the Marxists tended to favour. Fourth, we've got Pyotr Struve. He was a liberal leader who we'll look at a little bit later. Fifth, we've got the Besida Symposium. They were like a group of liberals who were more radical than usual. So the Liberals represent probably the most mild form of opposition to the Tsar, but the Besida Symposium were a more radical subsection of those Liberals. And then lastly, we're going to talk a few times about the Narodniks, who are a sort of spiritual successor, predecessor, sorry, if you like, to the social revolutionaries. They used the same tactics and had very similar ideas to the social revolutionaries, but were around before the social revolutionaries were on the scene. OK, so where are we going in today's lesson? What are our destination questions? Well, we're going to try and answer two. Number one, how did the liberals oppose Tsarism under Nicholas II? And number two, how did the social revolutionaries oppose Tsarism under Nicholas II? So if this lesson is successful, by the end, we should have a good grip on those two ideas. Just before we get into the content of today's lesson, I'd like to talk to you about the Cornell notes system. So this is going to be a really useful skill for you in terms of how you tackle this lesson individually, but also going forward into the rest of your A-levels and especially when you get to university. The Cornell notes system is a real improvement on just kind of casually taken notes. So I'm going to explain how this system works now. So you can see on the exemplar there on the right, Basically, Cornell Notes involves dividing up your page into three sections. The first main section is just called your notes section, and that's going to take up about two thirds to three quarters of the page, both in width and in length. This is the bit where you'll get your basic rough notes down. So your main points, your bullet points, your diagrams. You're going to want to try and abbreviate the information. So you won't want to write everything that your teacher or your lecturer says. You want to shorten it down and summarize it and put outlines in. Then on the left, you leave a little column for cues. Now, cues could be things like keywords, names, main ideas, and possible exam questions. You don't write the cues until after the lesson. So you go back, review the rough notes that you've taken, and then you write the cues in that relate to the rough notes that you've taken in the main body. And that's really useful for when you're going back and reviewing what you've done. Then finally, at the bottom, you have a little section called the summary. And this is where you just put a few sentences that summarize the overall content of that lesson. And it's really useful, almost as like an index. So you can go back and double check what were my notes on on that day when you are coming back to revise or to get ready for a piece of coursework. So that's the Cornell note system. And I think it would be really advantageous for you to use that system for today's lesson as well. 
Okay, so let's get into the content then. We're going to start with this extract, which is from Lionel Kokan, and he is a historian that wrote The Making of Modern Russia. This is what he said. For at least a decade before the 1905 revolution, the radicalization of all sections of Russian society have been taking on more and more extreme forms. The exact number of strikers, that's people who um, refuse to go to work, is unascertainable. They can't figure out how many. But there is no doubt that the general trend was upwards. In the main, the government's answer was repression and the arrest and deportation of strike leaders. In the countryside, peasant discontent was aggravated by a series of famines in, 18, in 1891 to 92, so that's the Great Famine, really significant, 1897, 1898 and 1901. But the difficult character of rural life was evident enough without that. Unmanageable tax arrears, agricultural stagnation, rural overpopulation, the paralyzing effects of communal tenure, all emphasized that the existing order was doomed. A background of rural violence gave birth to more radical populism. Marxism supported the spread of socialist ideals, while for the first time in Russian history, liberalism began to develop as an independent political force. So I think that gives you an idea of where we're going here. What this historian is saying is that amongst all classes and in varying different political traditions, opposition to czarism is growing. So although they all want slightly different things and they're all based on slightly different sections of the population, the general message that opposition is increasing is clear. Let's start with this image. Have a look and see what you can see. I'll give you a few moments to take this in. Don't try and analyze it too early, just start with what you can see. And then if you're confident, think about what you think this could be. So hopefully you'll have noticed that this is a scene of some considerable violence. There's sort of two groups here. We've got our uniformed men on horseback with the swords, with the rapiers. And then we have a crowd, some of them attending to each other's wounds, and they are having a terrible time of it. Now, if you guess this was the 1905 revolution, you're absolutely correct. So this is the repressive wave of the czarist security apparatus coming down like a ton of bricks on the 1905 revolutionary protesters. And in fact, these people that are being attacked represent the liberal opposition in the main. So that's the mildest, most middle class form of opposition to the Tsar. And yet they are certainly not treated with the kid gloves here. They are attacked viciously. And that idea should frame everything that we're looking at going forward. All these opposition groups, whoever they were, faced serious repressive intent from Tsar Nicholas II. So on to our first question then about how liberal opposition grew. We're going to start by looking at what did they actually want? What was the ideology of the liberals? So liberals wanted to push the country in a more modern and democratic direction. They wanted their chief demand, if you had to name one, would be a parliament in the form of the state Duma. And what they favoured was the growth of the middle class, improved education and the rule of law instead of arbitrary authority. So they wanted a set of codified, written down laws that would be respected rather than the sort of flexing of power by whoever happened to be the czar at a given moment. So they want kind of democratic fairness, the liberals. Where were the liberals strong? Where were they getting their power base from? They were strong in the Zemstva. Can you remember what the Zemstva are? Take a moment here to pause, see if you can. So the Zemstva is the plural word of Zemstvo, which were the local councils that were dotted across Russia and represented a kind of alternative power base to the Tsarist autocracy. And in the Zemstva, there was a disproportionate number of the professional middle classes. So your doctors, your teachers, your lawyers, your university professors, and so on. And this class of people, they tended to be liberal. The most common political outlet amongst the middle class was liberalism. And so that meant that the liberals were really strong in the Zemstva, and they could use their kind of eloquence in speaking, which they often had as a result of their education, to gain more and more popularity and more and more influence in those organisations. 
On top of that, their reputation tended to get enhanced every time the Tsarist government appeared incompetent. So every time they seemed to mess something up, for example, during the Great Famine of 1891 to 92, where hundreds of thousands of people died, every time the Tsarist autocracy appeared incompetent, the liberals were able to pose as kind of the adults in the room. I've put that phrase in quotes there as it tends to be a theme that's reoccurred in liberalism across history. They like to present themselves as the adults in the room, the sensible, competent, calm managers of society that would be able to run things much, much better than the current lot who always mess things up. So they posed as the adults in the room. Now they became especially radicalized and resentful and bitter under Alexander III, that great reactionary czar because he reduced the powers of the Zemstva. Why are they going to be angry with that? Well, it's because they were strong in the Zemstva. So if the Liberals have a power base in the Zemstva and Alexander III comes along and clamps down on the Zemstva, then the Liberals have been weakened. And so they really hated Alexander III and their determination kind of grows as a result of that move from him. So what methods did they use to resist? Let's unpack that now. Well, in 1895, the Tiva Zemstvo petitioned Tsar Nicholas II to set up just an advisory body, really not that radical of a demand. Remember, we've said that the Liberals are the most mild form of opposition to Tsarism. But have a look at Nicholas's response. He calls even that, even the idea of an advisory body to him was a senseless dream. So he almost mocks it. He certainly dismisses it out of hand. However, the Liberals aren't put off, and Prince Levov, who's a Liberal noble, continued to demand a national assembly that would sort of bring all the Zemstva together from across the country nationally. Even Shipov attempted to set up an all-Zemstvo organisation in 1896. So he tries to make what Levov uh, sort of dreamed of an actual reality. He tries to seize the nettle and really set up this national assembly, this all-Zemstvo organisation does that in 1896, but he's immediately banned. Tsar Nicholas II will not entertain that for one moment, and Chipov is shut down and his organisation is shut down. So how are the Liberals going to feel about all of these developments? How might they react? See if you can guess, and then on the next slide we're going to go into it. So this is what they did. They set up something in 1899 called the Besida Symposium, and that is a sort of more radical group of liberals. They see what way the wind is blowing. They can see now that the Tsarist state is never going to entertain their sort of mild, reasonable pleas for reform. And so they radicalise and they set up this organisation, the Besida Symposium, which meets secretly to discuss their chief demands for universal education and judicial reform. So making the, the law system, the courts, fairer. The Tsarist government then reacts back they dismiss hundreds of liberals from their Zemstva positions in 1900. And what that has the effect of is it pushes the Besida Symposium into the leadership of the liberal movement. So this group of radical liberals that had just been one subset of the wider liberal movement are now in a leadership role. And that's because the Tsarist state seems to be pushing the liberal movement so hard. They've dismissed all these hundreds of liberals across the Zemstva and so people think, well, we're going to have to go more radical. We're going to have to join with the Basidia Symposium. Now, that legacy, it gets continued in 1903 by Piotr Struve. And this man was a defector, someone who left the Marxist movement because he didn't believe in violent revolution. The Marxists are maybe the most extreme, determined opponents of Tsarism, and they believed in violently overthrowing the Tsarist state. Piotr Struve didn't want anything to do with that. And so he set up the Union of Liberation, another liberal group, and they called for the peaceful evolution and the development of capitalist modernity. So they wanted to just gradually, peacefully bring Russia up from being a despotic dictatorship under Tsar Nicholas II to a modern democratic country uh, comparable to Britain or France, for example. They also campaign for a constitution. That's like a written set of rules that a country is run by. And they felt that a constitution would let the working class 
peacefully improve the conditions of their lives so they no longer need a violent revolution like the marxists were saying and they could just carefully and gently improve their lives using the constitution so how successful were they well in some ways they were quite lucky they often escaped the attention of the akrana that's the russian secret police because the akrana were rushed off their feet constantly dealing with far more radical uh, oppositionists than the liberals so they weren't the akrana's priority so they got away without that kind of repression a lot of the time however that said their influence was ultimately pretty modest they and they were treated much the same as all the other oppositionists when it got to 1905 so they didn't really get anywhere they didn't get any of their demands particularly other than perhaps the state duma and on top of that they are not treated with the kid gloves as a result of being the mild reasonable adults in the room they're cracked down on just like everybody else however you can say as we just mentioned they did get their duma in 1905 although again one more time on the other hand that doom is very limited Tsar Nicholas has the power to dissolve it at any moment and to veto any of the Duma's laws. So that is the Liberals. Now on to the social revolutionaries. Again, I would like to start with an image. So this one, I'm actually going to go straight into telling you what it is. This is the execution, the hanging of a man called Alexander Ulyanov. And that is the brother of Vladimir Lenin. You won't have reached him yet in your course, very likely, but you may have heard of Lenin before. So he was the leader of the Bolsheviks and the leader of the communist revolution in 1917, one of the major figures of 20th century history and of world history as a whole. And he had to watch his own brother get hanged for the reason that his brother was one of the Narodniks, one of these people who tried to work for peasant uprisings and assassination attempts against czarist officials and that's what he's being hanged for here and there's a famous story of lenin who watched this public hanging of his brother didn't react emotionally and just turned to one of his friends afterwards and said we will try another route we will try a different path in another translation so in some ways although the social revolutionaries never turned out to be successful i'll give you that spoiler now they influenced their kind of their bravery, I suppose, whether you support them or not, influenced other groups, especially the Bolsheviks and Lenin. Now, just to skip to sort of the end of where we're going with the social revolutionaries, this shows us perhaps the high point of what they considered their achievements. Take a quick moment, see if you can see what's going on here. It's clear someone is being killed. Do you know who it is? He has sort of quite a distinct face and quite distinct facial hair. So if you guess Stolypin, you're absolutely right. This is Pyotr Stolypin, uh, at times the Minister of Internal Affairs in Russia. And infamously, he had the nickname or the association of Stolypin's necktie, which was the nickname for the hangman's noose because he had so many oppositionists publicly hanged. So in 1911, the social revolutionaries, they finally get their revenge and they assassinate Stolypin. Okay, so just like liberals, we will start with, what did they want? What did the SRs want? Well, they grew out of that previous Narodnik tradition, and their vision was of a revolution, a total overthrow of Tsarism, based on the peasants. The Narodniks and the SRs themselves tended not to be peasants. They often came from a more privileged background, and they would work among the peasantry to try and radicalise them. Although their ideas had sort of fallen out of fashion, they had a revival in 1891 after the Great Famine in the form of what was called agrarian socialism. Now, agrarian socialism is the idea of confiscating all the land off the rich landowners and then handing it out equally among the peasants. So it's a sort of um, like a rural communism almost, handing out that land equally. What did they do? How did they try and achieve it? Well, they continued the Narodnik tactics of sudden acts of violence and the sort of jewel in the crown of those was assassination attempts. Notably, the SRs murdered Nikolai Bogolopov, who was the education minister in 1901, and it was a student called Karapovich who was the assassin. Really often you find that it's student members of the social revolutionaries that became their, uh, their sort of assassins. 
Now, in the same year, in 1901, the social revolutionaries are officially founded. And what they call for in their programme was land socialisation. So that's that agrarian socialism concept that we just mentioned of handing out land equally and also decentralised government. So this goes beyond the liberal call for a state Duma, for a parliament, and calls for there to be no central government apparatus in the first place, for government to actually just be spread out right across the country in lots of more localised forms. So it's a more radical set of demands than the liberals. Let's unpack their ideology a little bit more, so their ideas. Their main theoretician, so their main thinker, was Viktor Chernov, who edited the party's journal, which was called Revolutionary Russia. Now, the ideology, it wasn't, in some ways, it wasn't that clear. It was relatively loose, and it was kind of like a blend of Marxism with an eclectic set of other radical ideas. So it was a little bit of a hodgepodge. There was the basic idea of the poor and the working class overthrowing Tsarism, but there were lots of different kind of versions and different ideas swimming around within the overall pool of the Social Revolutionary Party. Crucially, they emphasise the labouring poor as the revolutionary class. Now, that's different to the working class. The working class, according to the Marxists, was the factory industrial workers, and they thought that was the class that could potentially overthrow Tsarism. The SRs think it's wider than that. They think there can be an alliance between the peasantry and the industrial workers together, and they call those two groups together the labouring poor. So how successful were the SRs? Well, pretty successful. They did actually manage to recruit quite a lot of people from a wide section of society. So as you can imagine, peasants were a major part of their membership. But they also got quite a lot of people in from the urban working class, the people living in the cities and working in the factories. And they kept up that Narodnik tradition of stirring up violence against the Tsarist state in the countryside and trying to assassinate key Tsarist officials. And they were pretty successful. So they killed around 2,000 people, 2,000 representatives of Tsarism, just between 1901 and 1905 alone. So this is different to anything we're used to today, where an assassination, even, even one, would be a major historical event. At this time, 2,000 in a period of just four years that the SRs pull off. Now, among those, some big names were Sipi Agin in 1902 and Plever in 1904, two ministers of internal affairs. As we said before, they recruited a lot of students to help in these kind of combat violence efforts. And perhaps their biggest moment, their biggest achievement, if you like, uh, in quote marks, was the assassination of the infamous Stolopin in 1911. However, on the other side of things, we've just made it sound like they were really successful. On the other side, the Okhrana, so the secret police, they actually infiltrated the social revolutionaries pretty thoroughly, to the point where a lot of the SR's leading members, such as Yevno Azev, were literally police spies. And that gave the Okhrana a lot of power over the SRs. They were able to execute around 2,000 social revolutionaries themselves during this period, and many more were sentenced to death. That didn't actually end up going to the hangman, but faced other sentences. So there's sort of some success and some failings in the SRs in terms of the Okhrana's infiltration of them. Now, final task for today's lesson. I would like you to write two contrasting manifestos, one for the Besida Symposium, so that radical liberal group, and another one for the social revolutionary. When you do this, bear in mind the differences the two groups had. Yes, they both opposed the Tsar. Yes, they both want more democracy. But other than that, they've got very different aims and certainly very different methods. So bear that in mind when you write their manifestos. Be as persuasive as you can. And then at the end, consider which one sounds more convincing to you. If you were alive at that time and you had to be a liberal or you had to be a social revolutionary, which one do you think you would have gone for? Okay, we've come to the end now. So just a reminder of where we've been. Our two destination questions were, how did the liberals oppose Tsarism and how did the social revolutionaries oppose Tsarism under Nicholas II? We've looked at their different aims and methods. So the aim of mild democratic reform for the liberals and the aim of agrarian socialism for the social revolutionaries. And we've looked at their different methods. Uh, the Liberals organising through the Zemstva, or essentially just asking and putting their ideas out there, and the Social Revolutionaries using peasant violence and assassination attempts. Well done for listening today, guys, and good luck with the rest of your course.